Everybody, can we please start the game? I'm sorry for the rush, but we've got Peter Vilt from um, Urkut in Sweden um, on the line. He's going to tell us uh, more about uh, Urkut. Um, Urkut is an alternative to um, Turn It In. And we're very excited about its possibilities, um, etc. So, um, thank you, Peter, for availing yourself, for presenting Urkun to us today. Um, looking forward to your presentation. Just a bit more about uh, Peter. He um, has product specialist skills with over 12 years' experience within Urkun. Peter has been leading the implementation of the system for many of Urkun's customers and has been involved in both training and technical implementation as well as advising around policies, key decisions and best practices regarding use of the service. Um, we have partnered with them with a um, proposal for a university in Swaziland, last week still holding thumbs to see what happens with that. So enjoy the session. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, great. Uh, so, thank you for for inviting us to, to do this presentation. Uh, I'm going to do a product presentation from Urkin in Sakai. And uh, the Sakai part will be just uh, just a small, uh, small part of this presentation. So, I'll go through just briefly because uh, you all probably know what plagiarism is a problem. Uh, so I'll just touch on that briefly. Uh, I'll go through some of our philosophy. I'll tell some some things about the backstage Erkin, what, what we actually do in the background. And uh, I'll show you uh, Erkin in Sakai integration and uh, the Erkin interface. And I'll sum up with some of Erkin's strengths and advantages. So just to touch uh, a bit about the, the problem of plagiarizing. I, I'll just talk about one of these problems actually with, with knowledge. This is uh, to me as a former teacher, I see this as the most important things. Uh, universities are supposed to create knowledge. They are supposed to be the institutions of a country uh, that sort of produces uh, knowledge in uh, this country, taking the country forward. So allowing plagiarism to flourish at a university means that we will just end up sort of parroting information and uh, not actually creating something new. Uh, right, I'll talk a bit about our philosophy. Uh, we see that teachers struggle to get time to finish all the tasks that are put upon them. And we see that all the tools offered to an educational organization is supposed to make education better, but many times only steal time from teachers. We are trying to start at the other end, asking ourselves what things are stealing time from teachers, and we ask ourselves what we, can we do to actually help teachers save time. So you may just see us as another plagiarism detection system, but starting out in 1999, we've been around for 20 years now, we have had plenty of time to ponder and to collect feedback to make sure that we are aligned with our mission to help teachers, and we actually employ former teachers uh, to make sure that we do not lose touch with what we need to be to actually follow this mission. So I'm a uh, high school teacher myself. I worked as a high school teacher for six years. I'm on my 13th year at Erkin now, and I used both Erkin and other systems when I was working as a teacher. And uh, I could see that Erkin was the only system that I felt was on my side as a teacher. Firstly, I, Erkin made sure I was in control of how the system was used. So uh, I could decide when the student was uh, allowed to see the report and if I wanted to share the report at all. Um, and I didn't feel that I had this control with other systems. Secondly, Erkin was the only system that was actually saving time for me. Other systems I used were ineffective. Um, 
leaving me having to do more than half the work myself. And uh, they're also taking time from me in, in various ways. And one of these things that took enormous amount of time was when I used other systems sifting through false positives. So let me talk a bit about false positives. A false positive is when um, when your as a plagiarism detection system actually show a similarity where it's just a coincidence or there is no real similarity. Like uh, if you say the, the sentence cats and dogs, that's actually 33% similar to each other, although there is only one uh, cats and dogs and um, rain and snow. Those, those two sentences are just uh, are 33 percent similar to each other, although there is no real plagiarism occurring there. Um, so we don't want to show these uh, irrelevant matches to the teacher because it will only take them time. It will pull out of the report with the relevances. So uh, what we do is, uh, firstly, we use uh, machine learning to have the system teach itself um, common words and phrases making it more efficient the more text it receives in a particular language. Um, secondly, we do, not, uh, we do not rely on uh, X numbers in a row algorithms. Uh, that, that's my understanding is that all other systems are actually using a certain number of words in a row algorithms, which clutches the report with false positives, uh, and it also uh, there's also a risk of falsely accusing students, and it takes a lot of time to go through this. I'll try to visualize uh, what we are doing instead of uh, using an X numbers in a row, uh, words in a row algorithm. And uh, this is how I have uh, been explained to, uh, what we are doing from one of our developers. So what, basically what we're doing is putting the uh, text uh, or text blocks into a matrix. And we're looking for the same word sitting in the same position in this matrix will have a higher power. Um, the synonym sitting in the same position will have slightly less power. Um, if uh, these uh, words that are similar are in this block of text, but they are sitting uh, apart, they're sitting in another position. Depending on, on the uh, how far away it is from uh, uh, that position, it will receive less power the further away it is. So, uh, in total, when it uh, when it reaches a specific uh, um, power level, uh, it's um, like highlighting is triggered, and we will show it to the teacher. So this will reduce. Uh, the number of false positives at the same time as it is more uh, effective at actually finding similarities. So, being a fairly small company from Sweden in the northern Europe, um, we are about 35 in Erkin and we are a total of 70 people within the corporate group. You might ask yourself, how can we have customers all over the world uh, and how can we actually be better at finding plagiarism than other multi-billion dollar companies? And uh, the answer is that we are focusing. We are focused on, on doing just one thing, and that is being as good as possible at actually finding plagiarism. Real potential plagiarism, I say here, and not false positives. False positives. And the reason to why I put that, this parenthesis in here is that we, we show you similarities, but we show you significant similarities, uh, things that you should be interested in looking at as a teacher. Uh, we, we don't actually say that this is plagiarism. We just say, here's a similarity. This is relevant to, to have a look at. We also show false positives, but at a very much lower rate. Uh, right, we also take our mission uh, seriously. Uh, and during, sorry, uh, and during uh, 2018, uh, 2019, we are spending close to a million US dollars on content, adding content from more than 1,000 publishers. We are paying for access to the full 10-year backlog of, from IEEE, 
and uh, a repository of files for some non periodicals from Sengage Learning. And on, on top of this paid premium content that we have, uh, we are also crawling open access quality scholarly content at an average rate rate of 3,200,000 records daily. This was sometimes it's a bit higher actually, uh, where I think we've been up to almost 4 million uh, like for some days, but the average uh, seemed to be about 3,200,000 records daily. Through, through our searches, uh, we can also access over 8,000 institution repositories uh, worldwide. And other things that we do, um, is uh, like to support the idea of saving time for teachers is that we create integrations into learning management systems that are non-intrusive, uh, like we, we like to call them. We stay as a background service when we create new integrations because we don't want to disrupt the teacher's normal workflow in the, in the LMS. We don't want to make it so that the teacher needs to learn a new process uh, whenever they want to activate plagiarism detection in uh, their LMS. So I will go through the uh, Sakai integration now. And uh, for reasons, uh, say time-saving reasons, I only have uh, another 10 minutes here, uh, I will show you screenshots. So when you go into Sakai and you add an assignment, this is what you will see. This is the normal assignment app in uh, Sakai. So these things, if I go back, um, these things are what you will see if you are not using uh, plagiarism detection and all, at all. The only thing that we are adding here is uh, uh, one headline saying Erkin plagiarism service, and to activate plagiarism detection, you just click the box use Erkin. If you want a student to view the report, you also click the tick box allow student to view the report. This is actually it. This is the only thing you as a teacher need to do to activate plagiarism detection. So uh, I'll show you also how to uh, retrieve the results. So you would go to the, to the normal place, you go to assignments, and you, then you look at uh, the submitted assignment. And the only thing that we add here, this is the Sakai normally, uh, where you would normally go to, to review the assignments. And here, we have a column uh, that is called Erkin, and we have uh, uh, the file name, and there's a flag there. And if you hover the, your pointer over the flag, it will show you how much similar it is. In this case, I just uh, uh, added a 100% text that I took from, from the internet and pasted here, just to, to show you. So it could be lower, it could be, uh, and the maximum is uh, 100, of course. You click the flag to go to the report. If you allow students to uh, see the report, they will go to where they normally would see their uh, submitted documents. Sorry. Uh, and uh, they would see they would see an extra line saying Erkin report, and they will have the same thing. They will have a flag. If they hover their pointer over the flag, they will see the similarity score. And if they click it, they will come to the report. I will show you the report also, what it looks like in Erkin when you, when you actually click that one. I said earlier that we don't show a lot of false positives. Now, this is cluttered. This is cluttered with matches because it's a test document that we want it to look like. Uh, we wanted it to look like this, of course. So, um, at the top, you have uh, an overview um, representing the pages in the document and a visualization of the findings. You can actually click here uh, to actually get a, uh, the matching text directly on top of this. Uh, you have a findings uh, bar where you see what actually happened in the document. We have 27 matches uh, in this document and we have six warnings. And the warnings is for um, text manipulation to try to circumvent plagiarism. So there are a, way, a number of ways to, to do this. For example, you can manipulate white space in a document, uh, adding an X there, marking it as white. Teacher will not see it, but it will circumvent plagiarism detection. You can also use characters from other 
character sets to, to change some of the vectors in, in your text to sort of circumvent this, but we find it and we can show it to you. Uh, we also have a similarity for this specific yeah, document is 66%, and we're also showing next to it the receiver's average for the teachers to have the benchmark. Is this high or low? 66% seems high, but what is my average? Uh, we also have some tips um, for this specific situation. There, this could be different tips coming up uh, to interpret the report. And some uh, submission details, number of words, uh, when it was submitted, file name, who submitted it, message from the student, and so on. So this view is uh, where uh, most teachers would just go, have a quick assessment whether what happened here, and then they can leave. We don't want to keep them. We don't want to hijack the teacher's time. Uh, but if they want to dig deeper, we have um, uh, another view, uh, the findings tab. Whenever you've got a lot of matches, you might want to go through these step by step. So uh, in here, you can choose which group you're looking at. Do you want to look at similarities, or do you want to look at the warnings? And um, uh, at the top, you can choose to show in the text uh, which um, documents are, uh, uh, or what actually happened in the document, uh, any text sitting within quotes, any reference to other documents, uh, are there, uh, what actually happened, detailed text differences. Did the student uh, um, delete parts of what was in the original document, or did they add things? Uh, so you have these texts side by side, the student assignment to the left and any matching text to the right. Uh, at the bottom uh, of each match, you will have the source to the uh, link to the original source. You can click it to, to go and look at uh, how the original text looks like. The header will always uh, follow you. So if you exclude anything from this report, the similarity will recalculate for you. You also have a profile, profile menu where you can sign in and uh, change settings and options. So we also have the sources tab where you can see uh, the different uh, source, sources um, uh, that we find found similarity for this specific document. Uh, we have a legend at the top telling you uh, what kind of uh, source type it was. Was it a website, was it a textbook or a journal and so on. Uh, we have a representation of the document, sort of the document lying on the side to show you where in the document we actually found these similarities, and you can you can click any of these to actually get the, the findings uh, for the, the text up in a box so you can see exactly what it was. The number of matches that we made from the specific source and the possibility to exclude uh, a source that you find irrelevant. We also have uh, uh, an entire document view uh, for those teachers who want to have the full text uh, with all the similarities highlighted, all the warnings in one scrollable screen. So uh, any highlighted text, you can click to view the matching source. And uh, any highlight will be uh, uh, clearly visual in the, in, in the document. So, that's actually it when it comes to the report. Uh, I'll have three minutes left, so I'll just summarize uh, Erkin's strengths and uh, advantages. So uh, it's really easy to use Erkin. The report is very easy to, to interpret. Uh, most of our teachers choose one of these views, and uh, they, they make a quick assessment of uh, whether uh, they need to go on with this. Do they really need to talk to the student? What do I need to do? Uh, we have very uh, good integrations where it's very easy to uh, to start using Erkin because we don't interrupt the normal workflow that the teacher has been using before they started to use plagiarism detection. And one of the things that I didn't take up during my presentation is that we allow email submissions. So even if you use Sakai, uh, you will be able to have the students email their submission directly to Erkin, and you can receive um, the result in your email as well. We have a, a very competitive price. Um, we have good support. We don't need to have that much support because the system is very stable. 
uh, we are effective at fighting favorism and we have a low rate of false positives to actually support teachers in their work rather than stealing time from them. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Um, I'm just going to ask if there are any questions from the audience. Yeah. Annika? Is it possible to include um, other sets of publications, for instance, in-house publications at UNISA? We have um, the issue of lecturers actually plagiarizing previous study material. Um, uh, the delegate is asking whether it's possible to add more publications to this uh, list of sources that um, Urkund is um, searching through because they have an issue where um, lecturers actually commit plagiarism um, and then prescribing their own publications um, as the uh, source for the students to use, but it's actually a plagiarized um, version. Um, so right. ca can you add more, more sources? Yes. Uh, there's, uh we normally, when a new university is uh, connecting, we sometimes get like uh, suggestions on sources that uh, that they want us to index. Uh, we will also uh, very soon have uh, a possibility for teachers to, to add a URL directly into the report I showed you. Uh, that is fed directly into our crawlers, which is indexed immediately. You, we also have the possibility to set up the, um, an index that you decide yourselves on the university on, on how to share. Do you want to keep it completely private at the university where you can add the sources that you have on file? Say if you have PDFs or you have compendias and so on, you can, you can index these using our interface uh, and we will see it in the database for future uh, submissions to be compared with. Um, how you use this later on, uh, we we have some recommendations, of course, on how to use Erkin, but if you want to... I can't really address the question uh, regarding uh, lectures using um, other types of work and so on. If you want to check uh, these, you can do that. If you want uh, only to check student work, you can do that. So, um, but the usage part depends on, on your decision, actually, how you use it. But you can add sources, yes. Um, thank you, Peter. Yes, Alice? Just wondering, is it only integrated with the assignment tool in Sakai? Because we don't actually use that assignment tool. Um, uh, did you hear that, Peter? Can I relay? No. Um, is it only integrated with the assignment tool in Sakai? I need to check that. We have, uh, for some integrations, we have um, uh, integrations into forums and yeah. other places where you submit documents. Uh, if this is required, well, like we do updates on our uh, integrations quite frequently, um, and uh, we have good um, we have good insight in how how Sakai work. I am not the one programming this, but uh, I can check this. Uh, and uh, get back to you if we have an integration into the forums as well. Um, thank you. Another question? I think the actual question is, is it usable in a standalone form rather than being integrated to anything? You know, oh. you know can you just go to its website? Yes, uh, Peter. Um, um, I actually know the answer to this, but I would like <laughs> you to elaborate. Is it usable as a standalone and not um, when it's not yes. integrated with the LMS? Yeah, we've been around for 20 years, so the first version was actually the standalone version. And then we still have that, um, the, the standalone version. It's very common today that you use it um, integrated in an LMS, or we kept this, so, so you don't need to choose actually. If you, if you use it integrated in Sakai, uh, then you can use it as a standalone system. You can log into our web page. Uh, you can upload documents as a uh, student that will, will come to the teacher. Uh, the teacher can log in and upload documents and view the reports. Uh, you have um, the possibility to um, 
have the students email documents in Jerkin, and you can do all these things simultaneously. So you don't need to choose whether you want the standalone version or the LMS version. Yes, Shane, another question, Peter? Two questions. What is the average response rate in terms of when you receive your report? It says that the many of our institutions have more than one official language. How well does the data translate? Yes, across languages. Yeah. Across different languages. Uh, Peter, uh, first question is um, the response time um, once something has been submitted, um, how long does it take to get the report? Yeah, um, it depends uh, on a lot of factors. It depends on uh, current system load, uh, depends on the length of the document, uh, depends on how many matches we got uh, in the searches. It depends on uh, the size of the document, like in megabytes and so on, and the size of the sources that we found similarities in. Um, so these are the, the, the main factors that, that affects time. But 85% uh, of uh, all the submissions are returned within five minutes. Uh, and uh, I don't know the exact percentage, but, but almost everything that is uh, uh, under normal system load that is submitted is a maximum of 15, uh, 15 minutes uh, that we return it. If it takes more than 15 minutes, there's normally something wrong with the document or that we receive a match with, a, uh, with an extremely large source or something like that. Um, but um, uh, the guarantee is that it, it uh, must not take more than 24 hours, but even uh, in extreme times, like when we have a lot of documents submitted, it takes uh, a maximum of a couple of hours, even if there has been a really, really hard uh, document to produce. Um, and then the um, second question was the languages. I think um, I did ask that in one of your seminars or your webinars. Yeah. Um, so at many of our universities, we have more than one um, language that the students can the use. Uh, so can you please elaborate on the use of different languages? Yeah, uh, we, um, we are talking about um, translated languages, right? Um, yes. Or are we talking about uh, interface language? Or the, the languages that, that uh, the, the system support? I, I can take all of them. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. We, we, we support, uh, I think it's about so we have about 20 different languages in the interface, and it's very easy to add a new language. It's about six or seven thousand words that you need to translate, and uh, we have translation tables, so we just push it directly into the system. Uh, we support any document that is uh, uh, in Unicode, which is basically most of the, of the languages on Earth is uh, uh, it's Unicode, so anything in Unicode we can uh, we can receive and we can process. Uh, and uh, regarding uh, translated papers, uh, we we started out a project uh, last year. We've been doing this for almost a year now. When we started this, we didn't have much hopes on this being being good because uh, it's it's not easy to. There is not even Google Translate, which is really good at uh, making texts understandable. It's still uh, sort of um, there's still sort of problems. Uh, uh, you, you, when you see one of those texts, you see that this is Google Translate who did this. So it's not grammatically correct. They don't use uh, the exact right words in translating and so on. But when we started a project uh, that we call cross language plagiarism detection, and uh, we have uh, had the time to try it a few uh, a few times during the year, and it's really impressive results. We will release this uh, at, uh, in Q2, I think it will be. Uh, the prototype is ready. What we are doing right now is just building it into the interface. Uh, and uh, it really detects plagiarism. And we are very happy about this because we thought that it was going to be uh, quite poor uh, results when, when we started it. We just wanted a module. Uh, and we're then, we're then benchmarking this uh, against uh, um, other attempts at, uh, at doing uh, cross-language papers in detection, and we are actually uh, better than any other plagiarism detection system at this, and for this, uh, for just having a prototype, 
finding similarities, we are second in the world. So, but it will, it will be until uh, after summer, probably before you see this. In, in our off of the world, it's after winter. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, yes. any, more, after sorry. any more questions? What does Urkund mean? Urkund? Oh. Um, yeah, they're asking what Urkund means. Oh, great, thank you. I should have said that from the beginning. I, I'm very happy uh, every time I get that question. Uh, it's hard to translate to English, but it means basically original document, um, unchanged original, or maybe best translated to deed, like legal deed or something else. Uh, so unchanged original document. Uh, and uh, this is uh, a word that is common between German and Swedish, that's the only two languages uh, uh, that, that has this uh, word in common. Okay. Any more questions? Uh, there's another one. Uh, what is the future of detecting plagiarism in video assignments? And you know, our institution is um, more giving video assignments more and more. So that is a concern. Did you get that, please? Yes. Um, well, video is uh, sort of uh, uh, the one step further. We get the question about uh, pictures sometimes, and that's that's possible looking at sort of uh, uh, how a picture is put together, looking at the data, basically uh, telling you it has a lot of um, this color in it or something like that, or you have these shapes and so on. Video is a completely different ballpark because it consists of, of millions of pictures. So we are not even looking at the detecting failures in, in videos. Uh, there might be, um, like, in a year or two, something, uh, some studies that, that show up that, that can actually be used in an effective way. Uh, but, but it takes a lot of resources. And the one thing that is, uh, we are looking at right now is detecting plagiarism in pictures. And that takes a lot of computer power. So it would, it would basically be um, taking as much power uh, from our service as with one million documents. And if we would get a, a lot of uh, pictures, it, was sort of, it would be too costly to actually do this. And especially in a timely manner. So video. Uh, not on the radar right now. Thank you so much. Um, I think we're going to wrap up. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, Thank you. Enjoy the day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So we're live streaming this session again. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Henk Lowe from Northwest University, who, amongst his many talents, is also a canoe instructor. He always wanted to go canoeing. You should chat to him afterwards. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but in his day job, Henk is from the Center for Professional Language Practice, Center for Academic and Professional Language Practice. Another one of those interesting acronyms that we all end up with in higher education, um, who's talking to us about back chat and audio feedback. And the issues of writing and assessment are really core to all of us in higher education. So we look forward to what you have to say. Thank you. OK, good. good uh, it's still morning. Good morning. Uh, I've got a presentation with 15 minutes of software and about 
four and a half hours worth of um, theory, which I need to jam into about 45 minutes of talk time. So I'll be talking quite fast here and there. Apologies in advance. I need to start with what is Backchat. So Backchat is um, a, the product of a lot of frustration. I want to provide better feedback to my students. I did both my master's and my doctoral degrees on providing feedback on student writing. So we started with Backchat as a way to quickly and easily create audio feedback to students, basically voice notes. But um, then I don't want to repeat myself all the time. So we added um, pre-recordings and the whole system is optimized to save my time because I don't want to waste time. Now, I need to start with a few disclaimers. The first up, I've got a background in languages, so some of these examples may not be applicable to all of you, but the principles should be. Second thing is, as I just mentioned, the principles are paramount, not the software. I did this presentation a few times before, and some people said, yeah, well, we've got different software. You can get different software. I like mine more <laughs> simply because I find it to be a bit uh, faster, but um, use the principles. I use a white PowerPoint for readability. I like pictures, but sometimes they just don't work in a presentation. And then Backchat is in beta phase. I'm showing you 115. Uh, 116 should be out end of next week. I was hoping I'd have it here because it's a little bit more pretty, but um, version two should be out end of the year. And I'm, I'm not allowed to tell you yet what will be in version two, but I'll give you a sneak peek. Then the focus of this session will be mostly practical. I can bore you with a whole bunch of um, references to bibliographies and things, and I know we just watched something on plagiarism. I'm not plagiarizing anything. I've got some sources, but I'm not gonna waste your time with that. Then um, you will experience a duh moment now and then. It's like, duh, I know this. But knowing the obvious and doing the obvious are not the same. And I think by the time I'm done with the little bits of theory you should be convinced on that. So a quick preview of the talk. I'm going to do six things. We start with a practical exercise, and that's when you will probably experience your first duh moment. I'm going to give you a handout. Now, I've, I haven't got enough for all of you because I didn't expect so many people here. Sorry, but I've luckily got a backup on the screen as well. Fastest feedback wins. So I, I, I forgot to bring, to bring something to give the winner, but, <laughs> but you'll have the emotional uh, satisfaction of being the winner. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about emotions later on again as well, so keep that in the back of your head. Speedy scan on some advantages of an audio feedback. Um, that's the theory. I can quote you 40 sources if you want, but I'm not going to do that here. I'm going to give you a definition which is actually the crux of the matter here. What's the difference between marking and feedback? Because what I've found many of my colleagues to do is they think that's got a jolly good job, and then they've done marking, not feedback. Then I'm going to illustrate back chat. That should take about 15 minutes. It's not a very difficult software package to use. I had at the back of my mind, one of my colleagues in mind when we started working on back chat, and I said, if she can use it, then everybody can. So I'm not going to mention names there. And then more theory, practical theory, generic versus specific versus a combination of generic and specific feedback. And then I'm just going to give a few hints and pointers for people who want to use audio feedback. And that's not just applicable to Backchat, it's applicable to any system you use for audio feedback. So the practical exercise is basically this. I've got a handout here. Um, can I ask somebody to hand it out? Uh, sorry, can um, so all of you will not get one, but there will be one on the board as well. You can just make a few notes on a piece of paper if you want to. It's basically the introduction to a student text. It contains upwards of 30 errors, and uh, the topic, uh, the abbreviated topic, was basically for the student to write a research assignment in which they make an argument for, um, for adapting or keeping university class times and class duration as they, as they were. So um, it's on the board. Are class times optimally suited for, um, uh, if you look at, uh, at sleeping patterns and things, if I remember correctly. Now your task is, you will have three minutes, and I'm gonna time you on this, three minutes to write as much feedback as you can on this. But now I know that most of you are not here from the academic literacy department, so to make it easier for you, on the back, I've listed the errors. So you can, so you can go check me out. If I miss something, please, please tell me to go um, get a discount on my next salary check. Uh, let me see, what's the time now? I'm gonna set the timer. Uh, I know all of you haven't got it yet, but um, I'm gonna set it for three minutes and the one is on the board as well. Ready, steady, go. Three minutes.
Yeah, well, that's one for you. It's one fee. One, one for fee. <laughs> You only have two minutes left, you need to rush it. Okay, you've got about one minute ten left. Thank you. <laughs> 45 seconds. Go, go, go. Uh, if you go for 34, you're good. <laughs> 25 seconds. Okay, you can stop. Now, the funny thing, same thing happens here as in every class. Some people are doing the activities, some are on their laptop, some did a WhatsApp. But I had a few people working along. That's good. Thank you very much. So I want to show you just for interest sake, um, that's the whole list. That's the one on the back of your handout as well. Uh, some of them are highlighted in yellow. I'll get back to that. Now, question, how many of you got to 25? <laughs> one more, good. Uh, can, can I just see yours perhaps? Okay, uh, how many of you have something that looks like this? It's a bit far to see, but you've got a whole bunch of scribbles and lurk circles and lines and tick marks and scratch out. and You got that? That's standard marking. And you can do that on Microsoft Word as well, where you do track changes and you get comments on the side, and you can do it with most marking systems where you identify mistakes. That's a good start. That's what we've been doing for... Um, let's say, the past 1,800 years, so it must be working, right? I, I'm not that convinced. So I want to ask you one or two questions. First one, I've already asked how many of the errors did you get. Second one, you had 106 words. You spent three minutes on it. How often do you have the luxury of spending three minutes per 100 words when you do your feedback? No way. That's not real life. Second, uh, well, second set of questions, which errors do you consider to be the most important? Did you have time to think about that in three minutes? No, you didn't, probably, because I never get people to say yes. And then did you deal with them or did you deal with the easy ones first? The first comment I got was, your spell check is making it too easy. I've got perceptions already. Well, that's the easy one. We can see it. Boom, we've got it. Thank goodness I'm doing my job. I'm marking something. But that's not really good feedback, is it? So then... These are the most important questions. There's one more coming, but these are the crux of the matter here. Did your feedback identify the error? Well, yes, if there's a line underneath it, it did say there's something wrong there, but your student probably doesn't know what it is yet. Second question, did you tell your learner why the error is important? No, you can't. You can't do that with a circle or a line or a scratch through. 
You, you can't do that. It's not good communication. Third thing, did your, um, did your line or circle or squiggle tell the student what to do about the error? Most times the answer to that is no already as well. And number four, where can the student get more information on this? Now, obviously, for a spelling mistake, you don't need more information, but um, in some instances, you can. Now, number five, after all of these questions, I ask you question number five, do you think you've done a good job? And if you say yes, then please go apply for a job in, in government. So I, did, I, said, I said that out loud. Yes, I did. Number six, and this one's also quite important, did you place responsibility on the learner to identify errors and correct them and learn from them, or did you just do editing? Because most of the time, we get stuck in the rut on doing editing. And that's why I dislike traditional marking, because we get that. This is from a previous exercise we've done. This is hieroglyphics. And hieroglyphics have not been considered good communication since the Egyptians were the most powerful people in the world. And they, um, well, you can say lots of nasty things about cats. Anyway, look at the handwriting. I can't read that. I don't know what these abbreviations mean. We've got our squiggles. We've got our arrows. Um, it's not good feedback. This one's another one I got from uh, an example from the University of Pretoria. Um, I, I can see they don't want the text to be left justified. Uh, one of the errors you've got there is that the, the text is full justified as well. But um, this is not good communication. It's not good education. It's not good teaching. So this brings me to this point. And if this is all you take out of this, then at least you've got something. There's a big difference between marking and feedback. I've got eight here listed. You can probably think up one or two more. First one, quantitative versus communicative. While you were busy with that exercise, I had people ask me, how many should we get? 30? 30? 30, 30, 30 what? We're counting it. I did my job because I'm picking up all these errors. That's not always what we want to do. We want to communicate with our students to try to teach them. Second thing, I've already mentioned this one multiple times by now. Marking as we do it sometimes have little to no educational value, while good feedback is feeding, feeding back to the kids. We're trying to teach them. Little nuance when we mark, we can get a lot more nuance when we actually give feedback. Uh, often unclear hieroglyphic. If you do feedback right, you are supposed to be more clear. Summative and formative. We've got the responsibility mostly on the lecturer. Well, if we do feedback well, we delegate the responsibility to the learner. Then, number seven, number eight. Subject awareness is limited, and it's not always necessary for the students to see or react. You all have had the experience where you upload assignments uh, to the students, you've marked it, or you hand out hard copies, and the little buggers who were not in class will not come and fetch it, because they just don't care. I've got my mark, that's thank goodness, bye, I'm done with you. And um, I, I don't like that feeling of having worked to teach them and they are just not interested. But if you do good feedback, it's quite useless if not seen by the students. And they should become curious to hear what you had to say. Now this brings me to the advantages of audio feedback. Literature lists between 20 and 40 advantages, depending on what you um, chunk together. So I'm going to, I said a speed scan. I'm doing everything speedily today. But the most important thing you should notice here, many of the advantages of audio feedback is actually created by moving away from marking towards providing actual feedback. Now I'm going to um, show you about 19, I think. But I'm just going to highlight one or two as we go along. Speed of talking, I'm speaking comfortably now at a speed of about 180 words a minute. Most radio commentators who do the presentations quite well speak at about 130 words per minute. When you get to the horse races, they go all faster and faster and faster, and you can't hear what they're saying, but you can still keep up because you can watch your horses and they go to about 250, 280 words a minute, and you can still follow. <laughs> there are YouTube, well, you can speed up YouTube and watch a video at four times the speed, and you can probably still follow it because we're fast enough. So you can get a lot more said and done. More clarity, there's a better relationship between the lecturer and the student. It's more personal. And then this, I like that quote so much, I kept it in. Most studies have found that audio comments also provide a little level of nuance and specificity that's difficult or perhaps impossible to match with written comments. You just don't have the space on the page to write the specific comments you want to. Then um, it's more understandable, informative, complete. It's more enjoyable. I like. 
I, I simply like it more to be able to actually give an explanation than trying to think, okay, so where am I going to fit this comment in? Because you don't have the space on the page. Then feedback is seen as more constructive. You move into a coaching mentality and students are more confident. Also, um, lecturers say they are less judgmental. Students understand the comments better. It provides for better communication and so on. It's more spontaneous, multi-sensory learning experience. Uh, the people from linguistics will know crash in. It says it provides more input. Uh, the feedback is not hampered by physical space. I've mentioned that. And that one is my favorite. Nobody cares that my handwriting sucks. <laughs> Because I've seen the longer I stay in academia, the less legibly I start writing. And then this one, number 19, is quite interesting. Students are a lot more likely to actually open a voice note you send to them than they are to come fetch an assignment or even look at the assignment you, you hand out in class. Now, the, the good and the bad, audio feedback has some disadvantages. It takes time. It simply takes more time to do a recording and upload it. Uh, but I'll show you how we can save some time using Backchat. The thing is, I've had a colleague, <laughs> he said, if I do audio feedback, I just keep talking. And I said, yes, because you're doing your job for the first time now. That wasn't a, <laughs> it wasn't a welcome comment. But doing hieroglyphics is not doing your job. Giving actual feedback is doing your job a lot better. So how do I distribute it? I, I, and I'll give away my age now, but I had a lecturer who actually had little tapes with a dictaphone, and um, he taped himself, put it in a post, posted it to me, and then I had to listen to it and send back the tape. That took about four weeks to turn time. Now, with the digital age, thank goodness, we can upload and download quite a lot faster, and um, also <laughs> the distribution uh, to, to large groups are made a lot more, um, are, are, are a lot easier. But then number three, it's boring to repeat the same thing over and over and over again. And I'll get back to that one quite a few times as well today. That's why we built into Backchat the option to use generic comments. And I'll get back to generic comments because that's really the crux of, uh, of Backchat, why I think Backchat can save you time and be an economical, uh, an effective economical pedagogical tool. So I'm going to move to the practical illustration now. I'm going to show you five things. One is just simply the interface, how you set it up, how you can do your, um, how you can record your feedback and do feedback, how you set up your assessment scheme, and how you upload and distribute. Now, for upload and distribution, I just made a quick video clip because um, I don't want to show you my actual student classes for reasons of protection of private information and all of that. But then, as they say in, on television, when we return, I'm going to go into a bit more theory here. What's the difference between generic and specific versus a combo? Advantages of generic audio feedback, because I, I find some, some people are a bit worried about, can we really use generic feedback? And then just a few hints and tips on creating and using it. So the Backchat interface, come on, where's my mouse? Okay, so the Backchat interface asks for your name because um, we get some of our colleagues actually use four or five markers to, to mark the, the same subject. And you've got a few steps. We made it stepwise. You just follow the steps and you should be fine. Step one is to create and manage your recordings you want to use. So you can set up your recordings. You can browse the set of recordings you've done previously. I'm just going to show you. I've got a few of these already. If I want to make a new one, I click on record. I give it a description, um, awesome comment, and um, then I start recording. Now, usually I use either a, a high quality handheld mic or a headset with uh, one of those. I'm not as pretty as those pictures you always get for the call centers, but it's pretty much those headsets I want to use. So you start with your recording, and oop, um, well, this thing hasn't got a good mic, but the input level should start going up and down so you can see that you're actually recording. When you're done, you can stop it. If you want to listen to your own voice, you narcissist you, then you can play it. Um, if you're happy with your recording, then just click on a turn. If you're not happy that you started, <coughs> then um, just restart and do it again. So I've got my awesome comment, and it's up there, and I can start using these. 
So I'm done with my set, setting up my recordings. Now, one of the questions I normally get is how long does it take you to set up your first list of recordings? Uh, for, depending on how well you know your subject and how well you know your students, you can reckon on spending about 90 minutes on 30, 30 plus comments. So 90 minutes of preparation, but then it will save you a lot of time later on, I'll get to that. And here's, here's something nice. Some of these comments I set up five years ago. I'm still using them because I'm teaching the same subject and my kids still make the same mistake. Don't judge me, I'm not that bad a lecturer. Every year you get the same, same kinds of mistakes. Then um, you set up your marking rubric if you want to use it. So um, I'm just going to load one which I set up yesterday. Uh, all right, so you set up your, your categories and the maximum mark. If you want to add a new line, then you can, I've got, already got aspect X, Y, and Z, so I can go for aspect T. And then if I want to add more information, I just put in a break. Now, this is because it's still beta version. The next version will be a lot easier, more like a, um, a word pad or word interface here. So I can add um, another awesome, come on awesome comment and uh, I just add my marks for that let's say that's 50 because it it's awesome and um, I want to save my rubric and I just give it a new a new name save it and I can use it and then setting up my module to start marking I can load a previous one or I can make a new module. So I'm going to make a brand new one, a period. If you work with groups, then you can add a group name or a number. And then which assignment are you working on? And then you choose your rubric. That's the one I just created now. I'm going to add my class list. Now the class list is simply the mark book which you download from Sakai. The system is set up to work with Sakai. So we first get our class list from Sakai and then upload it from there. So, yeah, it, that's because I, I don't want to write up the marks. I'm lazy, and I'm not very accurate with numbers. That's why I do languages. So, <laughs> so, so we, we work with a class list there, and then I can even upload a greeting. Now, my standard greeting, my hello, is, hello, this is Henk Lowe speaking. I'm your lecturer for whichever subject. Uh, this is your feedback on your assignment. Please pay attention, make a few notes, and um, ask if you've got any questions, something like that. So then I can browse for my hello, and I've got my hello, and I can add that. And then I'm creating my, my setup. Now, the class list I've got here is a fake one, once again, for the protection of private information. But now, let's say I want to start marking. I've got my student text. Now, I, I still get hard copies in for my students, because it's easier to read than reading 400 pieces of text on a computer screen, but if you want to work on a computer screen, you can actually just work with a dual screen setup. So I'm going to work here with Adams, and my hello is already there. So that 10 seconds I spent to say, hello, this is Hinkler, pay attention, blah, de, blah, de, blah, it's already there, I've saved myself 10 seconds of time. Now I go through this student's text and I see, yes, quite predictable, she's got no introduction, same as all the other ones, so introduction missing, that's added. That's about a two and a half minute recording in which I can tell the student what should be in an introduction, where he or she can get more information, why it's important and what, what they should do about it. Um, linking devices, if they make a few mistakes with linking devices, I can add some educational material on linking devices. And then let's say I get, okay, the screen here doesn't fit mine exactly, I can get uh, um, a unique mistake. The student finally made a mistake that's not predictable, then I can record something, and then I just want them to drop down way to the bottom. So this one is for, I think that was student Adams, right? Yeah, Adams. Um, and this is the second comment or first comment I make for her, and then I record. Congratulations, student Adams. You've made a mistake nobody else has ever made. And this is where I can actually insert the student name as well. So they hear I'm speaking directly to them. And this recording can go on for five minutes. If I really want to um, <coughs> tell them how upset I am, I can go on for five minutes. And I can also restart, play, or return. And then there's, there's Adam, so I just go put it in. And I can also do my marking. 
So I can give this student a mark of whatever he or she will need to get, and that will all be calculated. And if I find something which I want to go check, I can go flag three things. I can go flag to check the text for plagiarism if I suspect something. I can go flag the student needs some additional help on referencing or language. I don't need to flag any of these, but I can. And then when I'm done, I just save it. Uh, oh, bugger. Uh, some marks are out of bounds. Mm, no. I gave them a bonus mark somewhere. Three, eight, four, five, six. Ah, there we go. Yeah, the red ones. They are highlighted in red, and I missed it. Sorry. Okay, good. So, save. I'm done. I've finished marking students' kish. Now, I had people ask me before, how much time does this take? And this is where saving time comes in. If you know your students well enough and you spend your time well enough to set up your, your recordings beforehand, I had some instances in my previous class group where, let's say about 15% of the students, I did not need to add an additional comment. I just used the ones I had already because their mistakes were so predictable. Even though I spent time in class beforehand telling them these are mis the mistakes people make every year, please don't do them, this is how I fix it, and blah, 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 they still make them. And then I just add it there. Now obviously you can combine. Let's say I add the comment that uh, some of your sentences are unclear, I've underlined one or two, please go take a look at them. I can add a comment just after that where I can say, Okay, so here's an example of one of these sentences, and I discuss a sentence which I don't understand or a statement I don't like or something like that, and these are all just combined into one single audio file. The student doesn't, in the end, get 55 small little MP3 files. He or she will get one, one single MP3 file, along with, um, with the marking scheme. Now, when I'm done marking, I export my data, and then that will go to my exports. Now, this is the, the student I just marked. Inside that folder, I've got the student name, number. That's the audio file, that's the MP3 file. And this one's quite small, because I didn't add a lot of comments. And then you also have the um, HTML file, which I'm hoping will show correctly now. There we go. So this is the marking scheme. The student can see the mark they got out of a maximum with the description. So this is just the standard marking rubric you use. So the student has the marking rubric, same as they normally would get, along with the audio recording. Uh, I forgot to mention, in Backchat, when you, uh, when you mark somebody's text, let's say you mark a few of these, I can move these up and down. And it doesn't matter until I say export. So the whole idea with, um, with Backchat is it's supposed to work with the student number so that it syncs with Sakai. Now to upload the audio feedback, I just made a, a quick video to show how that will work. Okay, now to upload the feedback you've created using Backchat, go to wherever you, you store your folders. As you can see, these are all the student numbers. And then go to your um, learning management system to the Dropbox. You go to the Dropbox in your specific site, say so upload files, and then from wherever you've got them, now I need to get to the actual, take all of these, and then you just drag and drop into where you want, and then you say continue, and there you go. Now it will sort it into each student's Dropbox automatically. Okay, and what the student will get then in his or her individual Dropbox are just those two files. Now, I always get this question, won't they all see everybody else's? That's not how Dropbox works. Uh, the nice thing about this is I can do this anytime, anywhere I've got internet, but I don't need to be on the internet while I'm using the system. I had people ask me, but I want to work online. I'm like, why? Uh, we're in Africa. <laughs> we're not online all the time. No matter what telecom tells you, we're not online all the time. So um, <laughs> we're working on a, the next version that will be uh, cross-platform. This one's just on PC. Uh, the next one will be cross-platform. It will work on HTML5 simply because it's easier to work cross-platform. But 
<laughs> the developers asked me, can we please make it work online? I said, no, I don't want to work it online. You can make it both, but not just online, because I really don't like that in Africa. It's just not working for me. Now, the point is, distributing the feedback did not take a minute for that. I mean, the upload can take a while. If I've marked 400 students and I've got, let's say, half a, half a gig of, of data, then obviously it will upload as quickly as your system can work. But um, normally that's, I put it on, I go on with the rest of my work. It's five to 10 minutes and I'm done. It's faster than handing out things in class. And the way we can do it then is, I've, I, I don't actually need to hand out hard copies anymore and I don't need to upload documents either. I can still do that though. So I've illustrated the interface now, but now I want to get back to this, the generic comments, which I illustrated the use of just now. Generic comments, if you want to define them, that's uh, standardized, pre-recorded sound bite snippets, which aim at providing clear, useful, instructive feedback on a commonly occurring error. Now, this is what I've done my master's degree on, not on audio specifically, but on generic feedback. And I, I, I there's a, Generic feedback got some bad press in the, uh, in the pedagogical literature. People will say, yeah, this is rubber stamp feedback, it's useless. Rubber stamp feedback isn't useless. It's useless if you do it at all. <laughs> exactly, it's teaching. So it's the teach, it's the, what? It's, the, it's not the tool, it's you, you fool. So, <laughs> right, it's not the tool, you fool, it's you. So an example of a specific um, feedback would be, I'm telling Johnny, Johnny, you made a spelling mistake here because you confused American and British spelling. And this word here is practice and you should write it like that. But an example of generic feedback will be where I explain, Johnny, there's a difference between American and British spelling. We're using British spelling in South Africa because blah, 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 blah. This is where you set your spell check. If you want to find out more information, go read that blah, blah, blah in your textbook. And I give him a lot of teaching. I'm explaining the principle, not the specific mistake. Now, um, eight, differences between, eight differences between generic and specific, which are actually advantages, most of them, for generic. Specific is created for a specific person, and it's created for a specific iteration of a mistake, whereas generic feedback is for a specific error type and for a specific principle. Specific feedback is a one-soft thing. I can do a 10-minute recording, and that's 10 minutes of my time, poof, gone. If I do a 10 minute recording of something that's reusable, that's multiplied as many times as I can use it. It's time consuming to create and use specific feedbacks, uh, specific feedback tags. It's not time consuming to use generics, but it is time consuming to create. You need to put in some time somewhere. It's context specific when you do specific feedback, but it's context specific to the subject and the pedagogy when you do good generic comments. Also, this one, and I, I said I'm gonna get back to the mood thing or your, your emotions. By the time I've had to record the same comment on the same mistake, which I told them not to do, and I get to student number six, I just blow my top. And every time I say this, people go like, <coughs> yeah, um, hmm. I, I, I did the same talk yesterday at um, Stanham Wash Academy, and the one lady, when I said this, she blushed. She's like. I did it this morning. Because everybody has had that experience. You've got a lot of patient with the f patients with the first one or two, and then number nine or 10 will bear the brunt of your depleted patients, and you just blow your top. But it's quite neutral. If you think logically beforehand, they will all make this mistake. Let me do one good recording. Also, specific feedback is difficult to count. So people will start guessing. I think they all made this mistake. And I've done research on this and I've asked people, what did you mark? What's the biggest, um, by number, biggest mistake your students made in this text? And they told me three or four things and not one of those three or four were right. Because it's the, it's the mistakes that irritate you the most that you think is the biggest or the, the most, um, most frequent mistakes. But that's not always the case. Also, and this is where the one disadvantage or advantage of specific comes in. It's quite easy and fast to do specific feedback if you do it the way you did your exercise when we started. Circles, arrows, tick marks, it's fast, it's easy, it's useless. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm full of good news, ain't I? 
So the nice thing about Genetic is although you have to use a lot of mental effort, you can reuse it and um, it's actually better pedagogical design. So the advantages of genetic feedback, I've mentioned some of them. It's reusable, it's less emotional, it's a one-soft creation, it's more clarity. Uh, you can fine-tune it with use. It's non-editing. I'm not pointing out a specific error, I'm pointing out the principle behind the error, and it's quantifiable. But you need to combine them sometimes still with specific feedback comments, and you need to combine them sometimes with good plain old hieroglyphics. So one of my comments, for example, is, You've got a lot of spelling mistakes in your text. This is because you didn't do a spell check and blah, 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 blah. Two more minutes about spell checking and why it's important. And then I'll say something like, in paragraph one, I circled a few of your spelling mistakes for you to show you the extent of the problem. The rest of the text is pretty much the same, but since you did not pay me to be your editor, I will not point out the rest of them for you. Take some responsibility and go do it yourself. I'm nasty sometimes, I know. So the combination of specific and generic, I find to be quite a powerful tool. The nice thing about a com combination of the two, I've mentioned this once or twice already, you can go for the specific to give an example of the mistake, but then you use ge the generic to identify, discuss, and explain the principle. That text I gave you earlier on, when I showed you the, the, um, the error count on the board, 16 of those errors were highlighted in yellow. All of them I could have done, I, I could have dealt with using generic feedback because I know my students will make these mistakes. But almost half of those 16, I can also add a quick five to 10 second comment in which I tell them that's an example of the specific mistake. Five to 10 seconds, it's not a lot longer than it takes to scratch something hard with a red pen. Now, generic feedback, how to create it? Good generic feedback is reusable, so you don't want to add references to a specific class code, a specific time, or a specific page if your textbook changes. Also, four questions you can ask yourself. Number one, what is the error? Number two, why is it important? Number three, where can the student get more information on this? And number four, what action is required of the student? Now, obviously, all of these are not applicable every single time. Uh, sometimes you don't actually require more action from the student because it's the last time you see them, it's their final assignment in their fourth year and so on. So it's not always applicable. But then also, try to create nuanced generic feedback. The more nuanced you can be, the more options you've got. So, for example, I need to teach my students the Harvard system of uh, writing references and bibliographies. I've got eight different recordings for the eight different mistakes I see a lot in their bibliographies. And I've got, I think, six or seven for the common mistakes they make in, with the references inside the text. And of course, those inside the text are often to do with sentence construction. So I can add a sentence construction tag, and I can also add a specific one where I tell a student, in this specific case, in line 55 or in paragraph four, this is what you've done. This is how I recommend you to fix it. This is why it's important. And if you need more information, go to page 400 whatever in your textbook. And then I can be specific, because I'm only doing it once. Also, link it to an assessment scheme or marking rubric or a specific outcome. I forgot to add the word outcome. Keep expanding. Uh, first time I uh, used generic audio feedback comments, I think I had 25 tags. I'm way past 25 by now. Then um, be nice, neutral, and fair. Normally what I do when I get a new batch of assignments is I compare the, the first five or 10, I just scan them quickly. Oh, I haven't got a comment tag for this one. And I'll go record one of those. And then um, be natural. Uh, you don't want to sound like a movie recording. You don't want to read off a script. If you <coughs> keep it there in your generic comment, that's one of the ways students know you are authentic. And um, we've done an experiment on our campus where we worked with mostly generic comments. And then I sent out a questionnaire to the students. I asked them, did you feel this audio feedback was personal and just for you? And 95% of them thought yes. They didn't realize it was a bunch of generic comments because it sounded natural. There was a dog barking in the distance. There was a phone ringing somewhere. 
It happens. This is real life. It's only in the movies where they don't um and ah when they speak. Now, I um, just want to check the time. We're not going to... Mm, three minutes. I'm going to skip this exercise. These are a few comments I got from previous workshops where we asked people to write down comments they wanted to record. Uh, these comments don't answer to those four uh, requirements. What error? Why is it important? Where do they find more info? And what action should the student take? All of these, well, every, every single one of them will miss either one or all four of those. <laughs> so and, and these are actual comments I got from, from lectures in the workshop. So I'm going to skip that for now. If you remember those four questions, that can help you set up better generic recordings. To create your own generic snippets, these are the 10 steps I recommend. They're not the alpha and omega, but it's a good start. Don't do it on your own. Work with a colleague, people with experience in the same subject as you, you are working on. Work in a specific subject, and then uh, identify outcomes and identify the specific errors which occur frequently. Then you give them a nice brief name, short name, identify nuances and, um, and levels. Name the, oh, I'm, sorry, I'm not following my own numbers here. Uh, identify nuances, give them a, qui a quick short name. Write cryptic notes. First time I, I, I made the mistake of writing out a full speech. My full speech was typed out and I spent I can't remember, I think about 4,000 words of feedback that I typed out. And then when I listened to my first one or two recordings, I'm, I'm reading this. It's not natural. It doesn't sound like I'm speaking to you. So don't write it out. Just make a few comments and work with that. Record it. Listen to yourself. And this is quite important. Listen to yourself because the one time I did a few recordings, one after the other, and I forgot to plug in my, my mic. So I heard... And that's it. So that's why we added the input level thing as well. And then refine it as you go along. Now, general hints on audio feedback. I mentioned it sounds natural to hear a dog barking in the distance, but if the dog's sitting on your lap and it gives a bark then, then you start again. Uh, don't drink a Coke or a carbonated drink because it's not good manners to burp in somebody's ear. Uh, that's also from experience, so it's not even a bad joke. Uh, use natural speech, like I mentioned, um and ah. Uh, speak fast. By the time you record a comment, 12 o'clock at night, and you do it like this, it sounds like this. It's not really good. So do your recordings when you're still fast, uh, well, not fast asleep, wide awake, and speak faster. People can listen to it again. It's not as if it's a once-off speech. If they didn't get you, they can rewind and listen to it again. But it sounds more energetic. Uh, they tell salespeople, when you make a phone call, don't sit at your desk, stand up, do it like this. It works. Then um, numbered lines and paragraphs make it easier to do specific comments. I can tell the student line 55 or paragraph number 4. Just to, um, Sometimes it's not allowed. Some uh, faculties don't allow differences in format, so sometimes you're stuck with that. Don't become a proofreader and uh, combine with traditional hieroglyphics. If you work on a digital document, you can still highlight with yellow or green or whatever or add a comment or add comments with numbers. And if you're working on hard copy, you can still use your hieroglyphics, but now this time the hieroglyphics are supplemented with something that means something. Now, this slide's a uh, little bit small. Research possibilities. I've identified a few things I still want to uh, do research on with um, audio feedback, and I don't have the time to do it. So I'm handing it out to anybody who wants to. I've got 12 of them. If you add eye tracking and audio feedback, do the learners look where you want them to look when you're telling them what they should hear? To what extent is more better? There's a whole body of research saying that if you drown student, students in feedback, then it doesn't help at all. So um, what, what's the cutoff point? Then how much feedback is used? How often do they refer back to the feedback for assignment one when they do assignment two and so on? Which tags are used most frequently? What's the ratio between editing and feedback? Because I still think you need editing now and then, but not all the time. What's the cognitive demand on students um, when they work with it? What's the optimal distribution channel? I mean, if I upload it to Sakai, they open it. I know they do. I can see they do. But won't it be better if I send it to them as a WhatsApp? Uh, how long sound bites do students prefer before they just shut down? How, um, how effective is audio feedback? Is it limited by their reading speed? Because now I'm expecting them to read their own assignment while they're listening to me. 
And if I'm speaking at 150 words a minute and they can only read at 80, uh, you've got a bit of a mismatch there. Then number 12, in which subject groups are audio feedback, um, is audio feedback better than in other subject groups? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, sorry for speaking like a runaway train. Uh, like I mentioned, I normally do this in a three-hour workshop, so I had to rush it a bit, sorry about that. But thank you for your attention. And where you can get feedback, uh, where you can get back chat, it's for free at the moment because we're still in beta phase. We're testing it out. So you can download it from the Bitly site or from the Google Form site. Uh, all we ask you to do is to fill out a Google form. We just want to know who you are and what you're going to use it for and which platform you want to use it on. So um, fill it out. It will take you less than two minutes. You've got the software as well as three instructional videos to show you how it works. And um, then if you have a problem or you need to get uh, feedback to us on some additional feature you want, you can just click on the error reporting there as well. So. Um, Version 116 is coming soon. I actually thought I'd have it here today, but we're a bit behind schedule. And version 2, like I mentioned, will be platform independent. We're hoping to have that one out by end of the year. So if there's a specific feature you want, go test it out now and send it to us before we start rolling out version number 2. OK, now I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Don't kill me. With all good software, it's going to be great. Hope so. It's uh, released. Okay, thank you. Okay, so our next speaker uh, is not from public higher ed, um, so he brings a different perspective. Uh, you will have seen his topic that he will be talking on. Sorry, I stole your time. Thank you very much. How do I get the, the screen back up? Thank you very much for the opportunity to come and uh, speak with all of you and also to participate in the event. I've enjoyed it so far and looking forward to the uh, presentations to come. My son has just started his high school career at the beginning of the year um, and it's taken him a bit of an adjustment. He's now at uh, an all boys, very traditional southern suburbs, Cape Town school. And there are a few things he's had to adjust to. Weekly tests, and he's had to learn how to not to tie. Uh, his elder brother has chosen a very different path for his high school career, uh, a far more modern contemporary school. There are no school uniforms, there are no haircuts, and definitely no ties. Uh, at the equivalent age, in grade eight, Michael, the elder brother, had no homework and no tests. Uh, understandably, uh, driven primarily through a bit of jealousy at the laissez-faire experience of his brother, there's quite a bit of civil sibling rivalry that has emerged about which is the better academic institution for fostering and engaging students and getting them to perform. Um, and the TAR seems to have become one of the battlegrounds of this rivalry. Uh, our dinner conversation and debates, or as my wife will call them, fights, uh, range on what part of wearing a school uniform, a blazer and shiny shoes, uh, fosters and gets students to be disciplined, to be focused, to be committed to their work and to their academics, and what part of it just actually hides a whole multitude of sins. What are the things that they should be looking at and doing in order to get students to engage? When I started to prepare for this presentation, the, this debate was raging in my mind. What is it that we need to do online to get student engagement? What do we have to look at? What do we have to measure? 
and what simply like shiny shoes and a well-brushed haircut and good morning ma'am and sir hides what is really going on with the students. The one thing uh, that does please me is that the boys can agree on one thing and that is for their disdain of taking a second language at school. Now it, it doesn't please me that they don't want to take a second language. What pleases me is that the moment they are obsessed with an app called Duolingo. Some of you might know it. So my house is currently filled with German and Spanish phrases and noise of this going on all the time. What I'm not sure is the motivation. They tell me that it's because their friends are all doing it, but I have a suspicion that it has something to do with a foreign girl that lives down the road. <laughs> I'm not sure. But whatever the motivation is, what is really, really impressive to me as someone involved in online education and online learning is the fact where a traditional face-to-face -face school and a very modern face-to-face -face school has failed, an app, online learning, has succeeded in engaging my sons wholeheartedly in learning a language. So I take a lot of hope from that uh, event at our house. Digital Frontiers Institute, where I work, is a, a non-profit organization, and our aim and our mission is to build capacity, human capacity, in low and middle income countries, where digital solutions can solve some of the big problems. So we focus on delivering courses and delivering instruction to professionals in order to empower them and to give them the skills and the knowledge and the know-how and the networks in order to tackle some of the world's big problems. We started with financial inclusion uh, and have trained people in over 104 countries uh, in a variety of areas, everything from digital money, artificial intelligence, um, anti-money laundering. Uh, and in doing so, we are empowering those people to find solutions in their local communities, in their local countries, to solve the problem of digital financial inclusion, or financial inclusion. We started with financial inclusion, and now we will broaden out into other areas. So e-health is one of the areas that we're looking to broaden out into. We've partnered with universities, so our primary partner is Tufts University, the Fletcher School at Tufts, uh, for an academic backing. And we're very proud that the model that we have chosen to do seems to develop very good results. We have uh, often close to 90% completion and pass rates for these online courses, um, which we're very, very proud of. But I think more proud is the fact of the impact that that has on the ground. So we have communities of practice that have developed in over 16 cities, in, uh, primarily in sub-Saharan Africa. And four of those have then emerged to form themselves into associations. So we're already starting to see the emergence of the professions in these areas based off uh, the starting point of providing uh, courses for these, for these uh, students and for these professionals. So to talk about engagement and fostering engagement in online classes, I think the starting point uh, for us really is around what do we mean by, I'm hoping this, oh, there we are. What do we mean by, no, that's not working. Ah, what do we mean by engagement? It's, it's a term we bandy around at work quite a bit, uh, but I think it's something that we really should, should grapple with. I see it on three levels. I think the first level is around focus. How focused is someone on the content, on the lesson, on the topic? And what is the degree of focus that they commit to it? The second level is what is the amount of commitment they are prepared to show to something. There is a tendency for us, and I think it's, it's different for us as DFR, but for online courses to stop at this point. That their focus becomes about, can I get someone to look at this content, to really engage with it, to spend time on it? Can I get them to return to do it? Can I get them to jump through the hoops that I expect them to do? And if they can do that, then they can get a pass mark. 
But for us at DFI, engagement means something more. It means creating a level where the emotional response leads someone to take an action. And why that's important to us is if we are to build a profession, if we are to build these networks and to build these associations, we constantly train people to have the skills or to have the knowledge. We need to get them to a point where they are able to engage enough that they take action with what they are provided with. And in some senses, this is the difficult part of engaging with students in an online environment. And it's the bit that we need to spend time thinking about and trying to foster. What I'm going to present today really is around our experience. It's our anecdotal experience with sort of 2,000 students over these 104 countries based on the data that we've been able to extract from them and our conversations with them and what we've tried to do, what we, what's worked, what hasn't worked, what's failed and what's succeeded. So I'm simply going to do it in a, in a list of things that we've noticed and what we've done about them. So the first thing that we've noticed about our students is the why is central, absolutely key to how they engage with us and how they engage with the course and how they engage with their peers and the content. We generally work with students who are full-time employed. They are professionals that will have five years working experience and largely have a, at least an undergrad degree. What motivates them dictates largely how they will engage. So those that are motivated by purely getting the certificate so that they can get a promotion or can change jobs, they are drawn to whatever is going to allow them to pass or get enough points to get through the assignment. Those that are doing the course in order to network and build out their profiles and to find new business, they will be driven by anything that requires them to make a show of themselves or any opportunity to introduce themselves or meet other people. And those that have come on because they have a specific problem to solve in their work environments, they are drawn to specific pieces of content or specific sections where they will engage heavily but may then disengage when it's other content that they're less um, in need of. So that's the first thing that we have, we have learned. The second thing that we have learned is that all students are different. Uh, we have, as I say, students from a wide variety of countries, uh, and those countries have different characteristics. We have different personality types. We have extreme extroverts who comment and engage on everything, and extreme introverts and everything in between. We have people of different ages, different life situations, different amount of time that they commit, different economic and financial situations. So they are a broad range of students that we have to deal with. Each of them has a unique character to them. So for these two things around the motivation or the purpose that someone's chosen to do the course and because the students are different, we've developed a method where we try and give as much choice back to the student themselves. If I can explain briefly how some of our courses work. So from an assessment perspective, we give uh, 240 point opportunities. So that's opportunities in which you can demonstrate your grappling with or understanding of what we have provided. To pass, you have to get through X number of those point opportunities. But providing the choice, we allow for all the different personalities and the different preferences to take place. Uh, we also allow for the motivation to come into uh, play. So for someone who, for whom one section is particularly important, they can accumulate a lot more points on that section than another section. So that's the first thing that we do in terms of how we structure our assessment. The second part that we look at is how do we produce different types of content and different opportunities that would suit different personalities. Uh, so we have a range of content from video content to significantly long readings, to research pieces, to collaborative work, um, all align different preferences of how you choose either to consume or to create content or create knowledge um, for the students. This really helps us be able to engage with a wide variety of students with a wide variety of preferences of how they engage. 
and we've started to see that this really works um, for students and they like the fact that they have some control and have some choice over the content. Uh, one of the other things that we've noticed with different students, particularly those that are working, is that they have different bandwidths in terms of the amount of content and the amount of time that they can, can devote. We've had to structure our timelines, our, um, assignment lengths, the amount of uh, leeway you are given to hand things, and to cater for people who are working. They may be out of the country for 10 days, 12 days, 20 days, very difficult for them to get to the assignment that we want them to do. So we structure things to give flexibility around that. Having said that we, um, everyone is different, one of the things that we have discovered is that online students are students nonetheless. So the problem of plagiarism, we still get the problem of, of plagiarism exactly the same. The problem of people being late, uh, we still get the problem of, of students being late. We get the problem of students asking for extensions. We have students who, the minute they have submitted an assignment, think that we have marked it and should have returned it to them. Those things don't seem to have changed for us, uh, being online versus being in a face-to-face -face environment. And we deal with those in mostly tactical ways and through hopefully good communication and through flexibility. This is most probably the part of the puzzle that we have put the most effort into and the most thinking into, is that we believe that every student needs a parent and friends uh, to help them through this process. One of the things that comes, one of the difficulties of online courses on online learning is the feeling of isolation and the feeling of being alone in this journey. And so we've worked hard to try and change that perception of students while still giving them the flexibility to act on their own and to have some sense of autonomy. How we do that is that we have class coaches. And class coaches take responsibility for engaging on a personal level with the student. Uh, so they have responsibility really for ensuring that if you are behind that they will keep you, they will encourage you to catch up. They take responsibility for congratulating you for doing well on something. They take responsibility for a bit like a nagging parent to remind you to do the things that you should do. Um, and that really helps the students on the journey through their course. Um, the comments that we get back, the feedback that we get back from students at the end of the course is incredibly positive mm -hmm. towards the coaches who they feel that they have a personal relationship with. The interesting thing, a bit like uh, the audio feedback where the people think that it is very, very personal, we can use similar tactics where it's the same comments from course to course, course to course, but because people get a personal email from someone, it touches them in a different way and really makes them feel connected. So that's one of the strategies that we will use. The other strategy that we use is to ensure that students see that they are in a class with other people moving along the journey. And we do that through a couple of different mechanisms. One is design so that they can see the faces and the attributes of other students. Uh, one is through a, a, an approach to feedback and an approach to uh, answering questions and exposing a lot of that in a public forum so that they can see other people are actually answering questions. Again, it's not necessarily that they want to learn from other students or that they are particularly interested in other students' opinions as much as we would like it. It's more the sense that someone else is in this boat with me. And because they're in the boat with me, I'm not, I'm not alone. Um, again, to give a sense of engagement and that there's someone there, we have uh, class coach calls where you can join a call where there are other people in it. Now again, we look at that and we say, okay, well maybe only 25% of the student population chooses to go on this asynchronous call. But the other 75% of the students know that it is available. The fact that they don't make use of it is less important than the fact that they know that it is available and they know that they are part of something, part of a group. Uh, so that's an another powerful. And then we have office hours, which is the availability of the teaching staff for the student to go in and ask the teaching staff directly. So all of those things we've worked quite hard at in order to give that feeling that I am not alone, 
that I'm part of something uh, and that I am being worked with through the journey of this course. What we have discovered is that size matters, uh, and that comes down to the size of the classes. So we break all of our cohorts into smaller groups. And the reason that we do this is we found that if the group is too large, that the student just gets lost in this group of 200 or 300 students. If we break it down to a smaller amount, the student feels uh, that they are part of something, and they start to recognize familiar faces within the uh, course or within their group. What's interesting, though, is if that size becomes too small, they can often feel too exposed, and it can affect the amount of engagement between students because they, uh, there's not someone to kickstart the conversation, or out of that select eight, there isn't one vocal enough person. So we play with the sizes of the class, but we, we've tended to end up finding that about 30 is the right number, based on the fact that a third of students are generally quite dedicated, a third are laggards, and a third hang somewhere in the middle, and that means we'll end up with 10 people that are quite vocal, who almost pull and drag the class or their group along. So the size does matter, uh, and getting that balance correct uh, based on subject matter and based on the type of course is very important. Right. Students don't read and they don't take instruction online has been our finding. This would appear to be a relatively all right response to a, a comment in a, in a post, you would think, or in a lesson. A couple of typos and spelling mistakes, but generally an all right comment. What is interesting, though, is when you look at what they were asked to do. This was the question that they were asked to do. So now it becomes a bit puzzling. How has someone entered their phone number into as a response to something when these are all the questions that they've been asked? And you will figure that out by when you go and look at what the lesson is called into the mobile phone. Uh, and inevitably, it happens in every running of the cohort. We've run nine of these, and every single time we take a bet about how long it will be before someone puts their phone number, and they do it. So they've simply looked at the title and gone and added something at the bottom. So we have learned that students don't read the instructions and they don't follow it. And this is one example. We can see it in everything. They don't follow the instructions on how to log on. They don't follow the instructions on how to submit an assignment. Um, it is one of the things that's not... Uh, down to education, it's an online issue, is that people don't read instructions online. They do what's in front of them. They do what's easiest for them. It's often a usability issue. So in order to solve for this problem, we work hard on our usability, and I'll talk about that a bit later. But the other thing we try and do is try and ensure that there is consistency. Um, so that week one and week two and week three and week four look and feel fairly consistent, and if you do it in this way in week one, you'll do it in the same way in week two and week three. It gives the students a feeling of comfort. It means that they know how to do it. It becomes routine. They don't have to um, relearn something, and they certainly don't have to follow instructions. That does lead to difficulties when you change your platform, because you have students who have done two or three courses with you now. Suddenly, you change something, and it, it throws them a bit. But we try and manage that through clear communication. But consistency uh, is very, very important. Right. The teacher matters, and the teacher makes a huge influence on the degree to which students engage. So, from the presentation earlier this morning, it is clear to us that certain teachers, from a marketing perspective, have greater appeal. Uh, we know that we have a few world leaders in financial inclusion, and when they have created and taught a class, it's incredibly popular from a marketing perspective. But I'm not talking about the marketability of the teacher here. I'm talking about the fact that when the teacher engages with the student directly, it has a massive impact on that student's engagement level. To give you a couple of examples of that, if we have a tutor respond and mark work and ask 
a question or ask for feedback. Someone's given a comment about what they think will be the impact of blockchain on financial inclusion, and someone gives a comment, and a tutor goes and tries to engage with them. We have a degree of response or likelihood that the person will, will engage or continue the conversation. If the teacher goes in and asks exactly the same thing and with exactly the same words, the response rate goes up significantly. Um, yesterday, I was uh, in a meeting with our COP facilitators from the 16 different countries, and their view was that the, in the markets that we operate, the teacher is given a position of authority, and so having them come in and speak to a student directly through a comment rather than a pre-recorded really does engage with the student. And it, it um, is an indication to the student of how they should up their, their game or how they should respond. So the teacher makes a significant difference. The teacher also makes a significant difference in terms of the personality that they bring to the course and in terms of how they present and answer and give feedback to students. Uh, and we can see a marked difference uh, in courses where there is a, a, an engaged student with an engaged teacher versus a teacher who is less personable, less able to connect with the students. So it is about finding the right teacher, not only in terms of the recording and the marketability, but then their ability in, uh, through social platforms or th through uh, digital communication to really have a personality, to have a connection with the students. Content is king. So in all the research that we do, so we do feedback, we speak to students, we do surveys. In the feedback that we get, students value the content that we provide um, above almost everything else. And so focusing on providing really good quality content um, is essential for us. We also focus on making that content available for people for as long as they want. Again, because we are providing a profession, or we are aiming to build a profession, it's not about getting someone to pass an exam. We want them to be able to have that content and access to those resources once they are now trying to implement these solutions. So we put a lot of effort and thought into our content production. I think there is a lot of material out there in terms of what makes good content. Um, there's a lot of debate about what produces good, good content. Um, but for us, it's a focus, focal point. And there's a few lessons that we have uh, learned that we'll, well, I'll share some of them with you now. People like video content. Um, they seem to find it an easy way to consume uh, content. There are, however, a number of difficulties with, with producing um, content for us, particularly on our markets. There's issues around uh, internet connectivity, people's bandwidth, but on the whole, we stick to, to video content because it is well liked. What we have found is that there is quite a good response when we are able to communicate the personality of the lecturer through the material. Um, so having even a small amount of face time at the beginning or at some point gives a connection to the student uh, that there is someone here, I know this person, they're looking at me, they're smiling at me. So that seems to have um, produced good results for us. Um, and again, there's a lot of research out on this, but we find that just continually trying to improve what we are producing, continually trying to new ideas and new efforts has given us results in the video front. And then around uh, layering of um, content as we try as well to give people options as that well, there's, there is a video that you can watch. There's a transcript if you prefer to read, and a lot of people say that that's their preference. And then we also often say, well, this content could be covered if you didn't want to either read the transcript or the video. It is covered in this reading if you were to go and do this reading. So we're really trying to give people alternatives in terms of that content and layering of that, of that content. And then our content is also, we feel a big part of that con of the content that we produce is actually in the creation of the exercises and the scenarios and the cases that people have to do. 
Uh, so while it isn't per se the creation of a five minute video or a long reading, the thought behind how you ask someone to do something or how you ask them to create something, we spend a lot of time uh, focusing on that. What is really going to get a student to think? What is going to get them to uh, want to do something? What is going to get them to take things to the next level? Which brings us to this. These are drawings submitted by our students uh, for one of our courses. And I find it quite amazing that we can get someone who is the director of a central bank to draw us a cartoon image and send it through. Uh, what we found is everyone, it, is, it appears, seems to like to do things that are fun and games. So we have a lot of what we would term fun activities, which are slightly left field. Asking someone in the central bank to draw uh, cash king or queen, the queen of cash or the bitcoin monster. On the surface of it, we think, oh, that's ridiculous. No one's going to participate in this. But the response is overwhelming. Often our fun activities, which won't, won't count anything in terms of points to passing, has, have some of the best responses. So really is something that we keep in our mind is that our, our students like to be engaged in a different way. They like fun activities. They like to do something that is enjoyable, that challenges them in a different way. So we work hard at trying to find new, innovative, different ways of asking them to think about the topic, even if they don't appear to be very... Uh, directly academically focused. They do seem to engage with the student, it gets them to think differently, it gets them to express themselves uh, differently. And effectively, we've built a, a layer of gamification or reward into our point system and into how we display that point system for students so that they can feel that they're on this journey, they can see all these people on the journey, they know where they're up to and where other people are up to. And that gives them a sense of, well, I'm I'm kind of competing, but I'm with people on this journey, and it just seems to really work for them. The COPs will tell you that when they have a meeting in uh, Kigali or when they're in um, some other city, the first thing that all the students that arrive to the meeting ask each other is, how far are you? How many points have you got? How did you get points? It seems to have really engaged their minds. Dealing with students in 104, it's actually more countries now, and those that, that can be vastly different. Um, it means that the content can be a problem because if I give you, we're building a course at the moment, and if I simply use examples from South Africa, it doesn't have much bearing for someone who's trying to implement uh, a fintech product in India or in Tanzania. So we try and get students to do as many activities and as many assignments and as much thinking as possible that gets them to pinpoint their experience in their location and within their job. So again, when we think about the content and the exercises, it's to say, what is this like for you in your country? So a lot of our engagement and a lot of the questions that we ask and a lot of the exercises that we get students to do is really around how do you apply this in your market or what is it like in your market? The interesting thing is, again, people really engage with that. They'll come back and tell you in detail what it is like to, to uh, try and build something in their environment or how they work in their environment. One of the exercises is you have to go and you can go and film yourself doing a mobile payment in your location or a digital payment in your location. And surprisingly, lots and lots of students seem to really engage with it and come back and show us the video in their location. It is nice to think that they also get to see what it is like in other locations uh, so that they can see. Someone that in India can now see what it's like for someone in South Africa and someone uh, from uh, Rwanda can see what it's like for someone uh, from uh, America to do those type of transactions. So localization or, or bringing it back down and applying it to their situation, to their location is very important. 77, this number, that we, did, uh, we do post-course surveys. And out of a class of 91 students, so, or 91 respondents, 77 of them said that, the, that one of the assignments was nice, 
it was, the, on the scales, it was either nice, very useful, or absolutely essential. So the person that had devised this particular activity was very proud of themselves. Over 80% of respondents thought that this activity was really, really good. What is frightening is that only 40 students had actually done that assignment. So what we have discovered is what students tell us and what they do are not the same thing. Uh, they'll tell us one set of things, but when we look at the data, they are doing something else. And the lesson for us here is really to consider the feedback that we get from students, the requests that we get from students, and then look at that against the data that we record. Um, because if we go down the path of believing without questioning what the students tell us that they like, what they tell us that they do, often we get skewed down a path. To give another example, if we sit down in a focus group and say to people, we are going to put together a, an online course for you, and the backbone of that course is going to be uh, videos, readings, and quizzes, do you think quizzes are good? Would you prefer other types of interactions? Their minds will drift. They will tell us all sorts of fancy things that they want to, to do and different interactions and different assignments and how enthusiastic they would be for it. But the reality is that we know we give them all of these options, but they choose to do the quizzes uh, disproportionately more than other uh, assignments. So from our perspective, and I think for anyone embarking in, the, in a distance learning online environment, is to look at the data. Look at what people are actually doing, not what they're telling you that, that you're doing. And it's a great advantage of the digital medium, is that we have granular statistics on what each student has done. We have a, we've implemented against our <coughs> system a Tableau dashboard, which can give us in relative real time, so up to, it's an hour uh, behind, but up to an hour ago, I can see exactly what a student has done, what they've engaged with, what comments that they've made, what assignments they've loaded up, how they've done in a quiz. I can get that level of granular <coughs> detail, and that helps the coaches when they're engaging with the student to try and see what it is that they like, how can I help this person move forward, and also where they're missing things. And then retrospectively, from a content creation perspective, from a course creation perspective, we're able to look at what actually works and what doesn't uh, work for students. And I would encourage anyone, look at the data, examine it, test your, your theories against that data. The internet continues to be a problem. You know, we, we, you look at the statistics that come out about internet penetration, about how many people have access to the internet. In South Africa, they tell a misguided story because what type of internet connection people have is limited. So they may be connected to the internet, but it is still limited. And once you go out elsewhere into limit countries, really it is a very small proportion of the population that have good, solid internet connection that we would, would, uh, that we would understand as being an internet connection. So it plays a limiting factor. It limits what we can produce. It limits what we can ask students to do. It limits them in when they can and can't engage with the content and with the course. In countries where there is limited internet connection, often people are reliant on getting that internet at work. So things that happen outside of work hours is much more difficult for them. Now, if you're a student who is working, who's wanting to do things after hours, that becomes a barrier. So we have to work around these limitations in terms of the internet connection that, that people have. Um, it's not necessarily something that's easy for a course provider to manage. We can't improve your internet connection, so we've got to come up with ways of allowing you to engage. So downloadable content, um, allowing longer times between things, so because we know you may not have internet connection uh, over certain periods, ensuring that where, there are, where possible we have lower um, bandwidth consuming videos or lower bandwidth consuming content. But internet connection is a, is a problem. And mirrored with that, uh, and aligned with that from our perspective in the countries that we're working in, is people's um, technical uh, capabilities and their basic computer literacy is also a barrier. A lot of people are not native 
to having a device with them all the time. That's something that is new, which means that what we might perceive as a very simple exercise and a simple thing to do becomes a prohibitive barrier for people. Uh, simple things like if we ask someone to load up something onto Google Drive may not be something that they are that comfortable or that familiar or maybe the first time that they're doing it. We take it for granted, but for people it is still a barrier. Now, for us, the solution to that is obviously better instruction, better training prov provision of those kinds of basic um, functions, but we need to align ourselves with, that, uh, with systems in those, in those countries that really help people improve their basic computer literacy. This is, for me, uh, it's the last point that, I, that I'm going to make, but it's almost, for me, the most important one. And uh, I think it's the one that Open Colab have pulled their hair out the most with, with us, is that one of the things, when I, when I walked onto campus this morning, uh, one of the things that I felt is, I felt like I'm in an institution of learning. And it's an academic institution. There's something about being in the building that makes you feel that. If you think about uh, if you travel and you go to Oxford or you go to Harvard or you go to one of the big universities, there's something in the air, in the buildings that makes you feel that you are part of, part of something. And that's by design. For me, one of the great challenges of online is how do you translate that into the experience that someone has when they are sitting behind a screen? And the challenge we have, and I think the person from UNISA said the same thing, is that is someone's experience of learning, of their academic experience. So for us, we have spent a huge amount of time and effort, um, and I think frustration for some people is trying to understand what does something need to look like? How does it need to function? What does it need to feel like? So that someone feels that they are in an, in an environment of learning that they are not just in an environment where it is a repository of information or a set of instructions. How do you create a feeling that you're part of something that has a richness to it and a, and a feel to it? So it is a huge part of our feeling and our, in our core DNA is how do we create that environment? How do we create the feeling in a student who may never go to anything physical with us, that one, they are part of something, and two, what they are part of has a gravitas to us, to it. I don't know that we have all the answers or that we've got it completely right, but there are a few things that we, um, we have looked at. The first is trying to make things have as few frictions as possible because the minute you create a frustration in terms of how you engage with the content or how you engage with your teacher or your coach, everything disappears. So trying to create as a seamless, as easy a process as possible. That's the first thing. The second thing is to try and move away as far as possible from a feeling where something is a repository of information that I'm just going to go through on my own. Uh, we do that in a couple of ways. We do it through design, but we also do it through the policy in which we release content. So we release it in stages, which makes it feel far more that you're part of a process and part of a class than that you have entered a library of, of content. So that's an, another way that we do it. We do, we do it in terms of making sure that there are faces and friendly faces of your peers around, again, so that you feel that you're part of a community, you're part of uh, a group of other learners. So that's an important part of the, the design for us. We do it in terms of the language that we use and the way that we try and engage and speak to students so that you are, feel that you are part of something, that you feel that you have a personal relationship. The comment in the presentation before about leaving the ums and the ahs and the dog barking in is, is one we grapple with, is how do you make something feel personal but still ensure that you're communicating effic efficiently? And we try and get a feeling for people of a warm, welcoming uh, sense. So from a design perspective, those are some of the things that we look at. We look at hard at what uh, students are doing and what they're struggling with through the data. And I, uh, I'll leave you with a piece of information that we found. So we had um, an assignment, an assignment type. 
that was completely unpopular. Out of uh, 200 students, we'd maybe get 30 people doing it. And we couldn't understand why it was so unpopular. And we started to look at the design and we looked at how people had to behave in order to complete this activity. And we changed some of the usability around it, made it more prominent, we uh, made it um, easier for the person to select something and easier for them to upload and download something. In the next running of the cohort, we've had a 2,000% increase um, in the number of people selecting to do that. So we now have a very, very small minority of people who don't do it and the vast majority of people who are doing. So design and removing frictions and making easier, things easier for students is really important to getting them to engage uh, with the content. The, the last part, part about design is really it's also how does that design fit in with the student's life? That, you know, your life is, your, your student life is part of a bigger life. So how do we ensure that this is an easy process for someone, that they are part of um, a bigger network, and that they are part of, um, uh, this is part of their life, and that they can integrate what they are doing in this course into their life. We have a couple of ways of doing that. So we're very active in getting our students as soon as they are on the course and getting towards the end, getting them into our communities of practice, getting them into our network. We set up WhatsApp groups to try and encourage students to engage beyond the platform and in their day-to-day uh, -day environments. Uh, and we set up various calls and webinars which encourage students to take what's in the classroom and invest it into their lives externally. So thank you for the opportunity to come and share our experiences with you. We believe that we are in the beginning of a long path. I think that there's a lot still to learn. Um, if I look at traditional education, it's still learning. Hopefully it's still changing, some of them. But for us in e-learning, it's early days. I think that there's a lot that we can learn. And through the sharing in forums like this, I think it really encourages me and excites me about all the various opportunities that we can implement to really, and from our perspective as DFR, if we can implement them, we can make fundamental changes and impacts at the grassroots for people and that we will have a profession of digital financial service professionals, of digital health professionals that really can tackle some of the big problems that we face. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Are there questions? Pleasure. Are there questions? Or? I'm Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that uh, that is a challenge. Um, we don't necessarily see a, uh, a difference in the level of engagement by the length. And our courses are four-week, five-week, 12-week courses, but we have a program that runs over three, three years. Uh, and that program is a collection of the, of the short courses. We, we actually see the reverse, is that we see that the students have done multiple courses are sometimes the most engaged of our students, um, which is, it, they don't seem to tire. You would think after a year or 18 months, uh, they, they, they are bored with this, they're frustrated, they just want to get to it, and we're not seeing that. Um, we're seeing that they actually have become part of this community and more engaged. Whether that's because we're creating a profession outside of the, the pure academic uh, kind of career, um, which may help, but we're seeing that actually people become more engaged off, over time. Um, so I, I'm not sure how you do that. From us, I think it's largely because we create this profession. You're part of a profession and now you're implementing it. I think it's a, it's a different challenge um, in your situation. Yeah, sorry. Is it me? Yes, yeah, yeah. 
Yes. That's the part I conveniently left out. Is the is, is the cost is the cost, but um, cu a couple of answers there is that I think so student support we see it in sort of two buckets. There's a technical support element for students, and surprisingly, that is actually can be quite demanding. I forgot my password. I've logged on. What are my fees? I haven't paid. I've whatever. For us, it's how do we automate that and make that as seamless as possible? How do we take any of the frictions? out of that because that will reduce our costs and improve their performance. When it comes to can we deliver this at scale um, at a price point, I think the answer is in the long term, yes, we can. And I think we can by using technology. So if you go back to the, the, the presentation <coughs> before this, um, technology can enable you to be incredibly efficient. So if we take the idea of, and it's a program we're working on at the moment, take the idea of cajoling a student along. So saying, have you done this? Have you not done that? Maybe you should look at this. That, we believe in time, can be algorithmically programmed. We look at what you have done. We look at what you haven't done, what you seem to have liked. We run the algorithm, and it will produce a personalized communication that will say, uh, you've done this and this. Therefore, we suggest you do this and this in a fairly uh, personalized manner. So we think a lot of that can in time be, be automated and reduce the, the costs down um, significantly. At the moment, that's not the case. We still have uh, a limited number of students that a coach can manage. Yeah. Outside of a yeah, so for us, I mean, we we uh, we slightly luckier than you are in terms of uh, we've got more flexibility. We don't have the restrictions in terms of academic registries and uh, assessments. Whatever, we have far more flexibility around that. Having said that, it does come down to innovation. You can do banking through WhatsApp, and if you can do banking through WhatsApp, there's no reason that you can't, in time, be able to take a student answer. Through, through WhatsApp. What we have found, um, and it's not answering your question, but we're, what we have found, for example, is that students are more likely to respond to WhatsApp than other forms of communication. We also find that if we speak to a student before the course, so we get the coach to phone them before it starts, we get a better response than waiting for them. So there's all of those kinds of things that are outside of the, the LMS. It's the activities around it. And I think you've got to make use of what students are making use of. You know, they're going to use WhatsApp, they're going to use whatever the social media platforms are. 
to try and fight that is uh, you're not going to win. Um, so I would say try and use them where possible. We use, for example, we've been relatively successful using uh, Zoom for conferences and for webinars. Um, so we do use other, other technology. But where possible, build integration so that it pulls back and we have a central view. Because what we don't want is exactly the situation that you're talking about, is where a student has done something in uh, Teams or WhatsApp or whatever, and then I'm looking at that student in our system and I don't see that, that there's a disconnect. Um, Yeah, so our analytics at the moment deals with uh, everything from the point at which we've, uh, they, they start to show interest in doing a course right through to the end process. We're now building it to integrate with our help desk sof software and the sales pipeline software, so it will give us all of that. And then from an M&E perspective, we have to then relate those students uh, behavior in like our LinkedIn forums and whatever back. So we try and integrate that. It's not a simple task, but that's the ideal world we want to get to. Yeah. Sure, of course, that would be lovely. Thank you very much. Thanks very much.